Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, uh, Mark, for your uh, kind words, certainly not underselling uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. He's uh, sitting there on the floor. There is some room at the back there as well. Uh, <laughs> What I want us to look at tonight is uh, things that could be better known about the resurrection. I guess you could um, say that most things should be better known about the resurrection. Uh, so we're going to fire straight in. It's going to be a fairly simple uh, argument. I have to say uh, it's been an immense privilege for me and my family to be here in Texas uh, uh, this week. My children had never been to America, yet alone, let alone Texas. So they uh, really have uh, seen the best. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, look at, uh, yeah, that's right, you get it. <clears throat> the basic outline we're going to have is we're going to begin by looking at some non-Christian accounts. And by the end of this, you're going to wonder what on earth it's got to do with the resurrection. But I want us to look at some of the accounts by non-Christians of how Christianity began. Then we're going to look at some Christian accounts, specifically of the resurrection, the empty tomb, and of the resurrection appearances. Now, anyone who says Jesus was actually raised from the dead often finds an objection that miracles simply don't happen. So we're going to look at objections to miracles before, mysteriously and cryptically, we look at what I call the third leg of the stool, uh, which is a further element in the argument for the resurrection. So let's begin with what non-Christians said about how Christianity began. And I want to consider three uh, in particular. I want to begin with Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus was born around the year 56. Uh, not quite sure, but something like that. And he was a historian. He also was a politician. And he's someone that people rely on for history for maybe 40 years before he was born. Uh, and often writing about things that happened in very different places. But here, in this passage we're going to read, he writes about what happened in his hometown of Rome when he was a young boy, around aged eight. You might say, well, I don't trust every eight-year-old, but nevertheless, by the standards of, that people use for ancient historians, he's pretty close to the event. And here, he talks about a great fire that took place in Rome in the year 64. And it was thought that the emperor, Nero, a rather mad guy, had started the fire. Starting a fire uh, on your capital city tends to make you less popular. And so Nero was worried about his popularity, and therefore he found another group to blame. And this is where we take it up the story. But neither helped by humans, nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating heaven could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That means order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted his culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd called Christians. We're just going to pause there. The crowd called Christians. The word Christian occurs in the New Testament how many times? Does anyone know how many times it occurs? Not twice, thrice, that's right, three times it occurs. And all three times it is used by outsiders to describe Christians. Twice in the book of Acts, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, called that by others. Then we have Agrippa uh, saying, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, to Paul. And then we have in 1 Peter chapter 3, if anyone suffers for that name, let them not be ashamed. So each time it's outsider language. Now that's an interesting thing, because sometimes a term like that begins first with outsiders calling insiders it, and then the insiders adopt it to call themselves, you see? So, for instance, Quakers were first called Quakers by non-Quakers. It was an insult, then the Quakers adopt it for themselves. Methodists were first called Methodists as an insult by outsiders, then they adopt the term for themselves. And it's exactly the same with Christians. But notice here what we have in Tacitus, that it is the crowd that calls people Christians. That agrees exactly with what we have in the New Testament, showing us, by the way, that the New Testament documents come from the earliest stage before Christians had started calling themselves Christians. You see? So the crowd call them Christians. What can we tell from that name Christian? Well, Christian comes from uh, people who follow Christ, or Christus, as the Latin word is. 
Now, that word itself is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So if anyone's called Christian, we know that they must be someone who thinks that the Jewish Messiah has come. So already from this very word, we can tell a certain amount about Christian belief. Well, Tacitus goes on. And he says, Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Tiberius was emperor from the year 14 through to the year 37. So we get a chronological range for when Christ was put to death. It happened by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Remember him from the New Testament. While he, according to external sources, was governor of Judea from the year 26 to 36. So again, we can know within a certain chronological range when Jesus was put to death using not the New Testament but external sources. And he continues, and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. <laughs> you wouldn't say that about your own city, but he said it about his. Well, <clears throat> what we notice here, of course, he's not at all favorable towards Christians, but he confirms some key things, including that Christianity began in Judea which is exactly, of course, what the New Testament tells us. Then we consider how he continues. First, then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on account of arson as for hatred of the human race. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs, or they were fastened on crosses, and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. So you can see a little bit from this. We can see a certain amount that agrees with the New Testament, and we can also see that it was very difficult to be a Christian. Notice that thing in that last slide, that he talks about vast numbers being arrested. Just the Christians that were known about by Nero con constituted vast numbers, and this is within 30 or 35 years of the beginnings of Christianity. Christianity has spread all the way from Judea to Rome in that short time, and there are many, many Christians. Now, what has that got to do with the resurrection? Precisely this. Knowing how far and how fast Christianity spread is part of the background knowledge that we need to use when we come to judge whether it would have been possible for the story of the resurrection to have been made up later. And my view is this, that the further Christianity had spread, the more people have become Christians, the more you require a belief like the resurrection right up front to explain how it became so popular. What's more, it's very hard to explain a belief like the resurrection coming in at a later stage, 20 or 30 or 40 years after Christianity had begun spreading, when so many people have become Christians. It becomes very impractical to change a publicity campaign halfway through, so to speak. It doesn't work. So I would suggest this sort of information is absolutely key to understanding uh, the evidence for the resurrection. Let's go on to a second writer. This person, Pliny, was a politician and became governor of Bithynia, that's northwest Turkey in today's terms, around the year 112. He writes to the emperor talking about uh, Christians and how he was dealing with Christians at the time and, of course, asking the all-wise emperor to give him advice as to what he should do. So he talks about what he was already doing. I interrogated these people as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, I interrogated them a second and a third time, threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be led off. That means led off to execution. As for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked the gods in words given by me and prayed with, wine, uh, with incense and wine offerings to your statue, which I had ordered to be brought for this very purpose, along with the images of the gods, and also cursed Christ, which is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do, I thought they should be discharged. Well, you can see he's a pretty nice guy. Uh, <clears throat> His argument is this. Don't kill everyone who's ever been called a Christian. Only kill those who persist stubbornly to call themselves Christians once you threaten them. 
And there are some other tests that you apply to check that people aren't Christians. Three in particular. They have to worship other gods, worship the emperor or Roman gods. The logic of that is, of course, that Christians are not willing to worship other gods. Also, they need to make sacrifices to these other gods. And then finally, they need to curse Christ. And I love this phrase which he adds, which it's said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do. Because, of course, here we have the governor of northwest Turkey writing to the emperor within about 80 years of the beginnings of Christianity, making the distinction between a true Christian and a Christian in name only. Isn't that fascinating? Within 100 years of it starting, of course, there are today, and there were back then, people who are Christians in name. And here we see that he's making the distinction, of course, having learnt that from uh, Christians themselves. This is a slightly later stage from what we saw in Tacitus, where it's outsiders who call people Christians. Now, uh, Christians at this stage, by the year 112, are willing to call themselves um, uh, Christians. And also, uh, there are some people who are wanting to call themselves Christians, even though they're not true Christians. But the logic of what he's doing is that Christians only worship one God. Now that's an interesting thing, because we know that Christianity began as a messianic movement. That's the whole idea. Christ equals Messiah. We know it began in Judea. We know from the New Testament, but we also know from other sources that Christianity began as a Jewish movement. Now let's just think about this. How many gods do Jews believe in? One. That's right. God, Jews only believe in one God. That's pretty important because the logic behind this is you only worship that one being. That's going to be important when we see uh, how the passage continues. He talks about a document which named people as Christians, denounced them as Christians, and said this. Others named in the document said that they were Christians, but later denied it, saying that they had been, but they'd ceased three years ago or many years ago or even as much as 20 and so he then continues with what people who had ceased to be Christians described as going on in a Christian meeting. Three years or even 20 years before. Well, let's think about that. If he's writing in the year 112, 20 years before gives us approximately the year 92. So here what follows is a description of a first century Christian meeting according to people who have renounced the Christian faith. Let's read about it. They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error. They'd been accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. Great time to have a church meeting. Well, I guess if you've got slaves in your congregation, you better begin before they start work. And to sing antiphonally, that's one group to another, a song to Christ as to a God. And to bind themselves by an oath, not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. So a great emphasis on honesty we have in this meeting as well. But notice that they are singing to Christ as to a God. Now this document is in Latin, and there is no Latin word a, so it could be as to a God or as to God. We don't really know, but what we do know this is that Jews only worship one God. The logic of the first bit of the quotation is that they would only worship, the Christians would only worship one being. They won't just worship the emperor. So if they're worshiping Christ, surely the logic of it is this, that they have identified Christ as that one God. Now, some people have a view of how worshiping Christ arose, that it arose over a long period of time. Some sort of telephone game version. Now, I talked about the telephone game last year for any of you who are there who have seen that video. But the, the basic idea is this, that gradually over time, people had more and more exalted views of Christ. Uh, and so at first, they thought he was a very special person, then a very, very special person, then a very, very, very special person, then a very, 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 very special person, and then halfway to God, and then eventually three-quarters of the way to God, and finally, God himself after hundreds of years. There is a mathematical problem with this, ladies and gentlemen. The mathematical problem is this. Jews cannot ever have one and a half gods. It's not allowed. The total number of Jewish gods always has to add up to one. Okay? That contrasts with Greeks. It contrasts with Romans. How many gods can Greeks and Romans have? Lots. It's not a bound set. 
If a Greek god looks down from the sky, sees a pretty woman, gets together with her, they produce offspring, then you've got another half god. You see, you just keep on going. But the logic of this passage is that the Christians would only worship one being, and look, they're worshiping Christ. So that's a striking thing um, uh, that we can say in the context of getting to an argument about the resurrection. Then Pliny continues. Many people of every age, every rank, and of both sexes are being and will be called to trial. Nor is it only the cities that are affected, but the disease of this superstition is also reaching villages and ranches, farmsteads. It seems possible to check and correct this. It's pretty well agreed that the temples, which had almost become deserted, have now begun to be frequented again. And all the sacred rites which had been neglected for a long time are recommencing, and the flesh for sacrificial rites is being sold, for which, up to now, it was hard to find a purchaser. Now think about this. Governor of northwest Turkey writing to the emperor within about 80 years of the beginnings of Christianity, saying so many people in his area had become Christians that the temples are almost deserted and no one's buying sacrificial meat. It's quite striking, isn't it? how many people became Christians. We also know it agrees with Tastus how hard it was to be a Christian. We also know, by the way, it agrees with the New Testament, which tells you how hard it was to be a Christian, how many people became Christians. Look at the book of Acts. And then we're struck. Go to Acts chapter 19, and you will there read about the great riot there was in Turkey, in Ephesus, when so many people became Christians that the silver workers who made the idols that people worshipped were worried about their trade, the simple economic effects of people becoming Christians. Well, it's very similar to what we read here. Many, many people becoming Christians. <clears throat> well, I've given you two accounts by um, uh, uh, Roman authors and we can see just how far Christianity spread. I want us to come on to a uh, Jewish writer, and that is Josephus. He was writing about what happened in his hometown of Jerusalem when he's around age 25. So he, again, it's amazingly close to the events for any ancient record that we have. But he describes what happened in the year 62 when there's a power vacuum, and the high priest sees power, and he says this. He assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before it the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ, whose name was James and some others. And when he had made an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he handed them over to be stoned. Well, that's quite striking, isn't it, really? Uh, because what we have here is a record of how James, recorded in the New Testament as a leader of the early church, was killed. The New Testament agrees with Josephus that Jesus had a brother called James, Mark chapter 6, verse 3. So what we find is an agreement here. But think about this. He is dying for belief in his brother. So there are people a long way away in Rome and in Bithynia who are dying for their belief. We also have people very close to the events. How many of you could persuade your brother or sister that you're the son of God? It's quite tough, isn't it? I mean, particularly when they've seen your bedroom. But <laughs> so basically, the Christian and the non-Christian evidence agrees. There are people close at hand, there are people far away, but there is a very high cost to being a Christian. That I want as background information when we come on to the Christian accounts. Now, someone might say, I'm not interested in Christian accounts. How can I trust them? They're biased. Well, firstly, bias does not mean that something should not be considered. After all, if someone accused you falsely of something, you have a vested interest in defending yourself. And someone might say, well, you've got a vested interest. We're going to discount your testimony. That's not very fair, is it? So bias isn't a reason to discount something. And of course, most things about most subjects are written by people who are really into the subject. So people who write about computer games tend to be geeks. People who write about um, certain sports tend to be into those sports. So of course we expect most of the documents about early Christianity to be by Christians. That's not surprising. But what we can say is there are many Christian accounts which give us evidence of the resurrection. In fact, 27, just if we include the New Testament. <clears throat> 
not all of them talk about the resurrection, but every single book in the New Testament presupposes that Jesus is alive in some way, and some of them go into much more detail. There are books that we could look at outside the Gospels which give us evidence. Consider, for instance, 1 Corinthians, written roughly around the year 55. There, Paul writes to the church and says that he had received the resurrection as a teaching when he was first converted, and that he had passed it on to the Corinthians when they had first been evangelized, and that he had reported to them how many people had seen Jesus risen from the dead, and how included amongst that were 500 people who had seen Jesus at one period, most of them still alive. Now, it could be, of course, a very clever bluff. Paul writes to a church uh, suggesting there are many people who've seen Jesus risen from the dead, and yet they can't actually go and meet any of them. But it wouldn't really work, would it? Because Paul has co-workers. What would they think about this? It doesn't really work as a bluff. There have to be those sort of people, or else Paul starts losing credibility. And by the way, he does want credibility with the Corinthians. That's very clear. We could look at the letter of Galatians, written somewhat earlier. Uh, Galatians begins with an argument that says, I have received my message from God, and I got it when I was converted. That has to be, when you add up the numbers in Galatians 1, sometime by the mid-30s at the latest.